This month on In the Life. Picketing was the extreme expression of dissent par excellence. Nobody had ever done this before. The challenge was not being gay and Catholic. The challenge was being honest. To me, it was more important that she had a good relationship with her partner than that she actually was a lesbian. This wasn't going to be a one-night stand. If an archives doesn't outlast at least one generation, it's not an archives. All this and more on America's Gay and Lesbian News Magazine. Funded in part by the H. Van Ameringen Foundation. Additional support provided by the Ford Foundation, the New Pole Foundation, the Overbrook Foundation, Michael A. Leppin, and the annual support of In the Life members like you. Welcome to In the Life. I'm Cherry Jones, and I'm happy to be back hosting this evening's program, Pieces of History. As a kid growing up in the small town of Paris, Tennessee, I was drawn to stories about real people who were doing interesting, exciting, and sometimes brave things. Their lives inspired me to imagine new possibilities. Tonight, In the Life returns to its archives to highlight some remarkable people whose stories reveal the rich history of the LGBT community. Their stories will inspire you. It's easy to forget that it was only 40 years ago when some progressive individuals dared to come out of the closet and march through the streets calling for gay rights. Their brave first steps inspired a movement. This is the front of the famous Independence Hall in Philadelphia, and this is where we had gay picketing demonstrations every July 4 from 1965 through 1969. People think of the Stonewall Rebellion as uh, uh, the start of the gay civil rights movement. That's a myth. There was a movement starting back in the late 1940s, and it gradually evolved, and it picked up steam, and we were doing this very revolutionary picketing in the 1960s before Stonewall ever happened. Frank Kameny was instrumental in organizing the pickets, not only in Philadelphia, but also in Washington, D.C., where he keeps an informal archive of the picket signs in his attic. These are, these are stacks of various gay-related uh, picketing signs from a variety of demonstrations in Washington and also Philadelphia in the middle 60s. Um, activism and expressions of dissent hadn't uh, reached the levels that they did by the latter 60s and picketing in some such places as the front of the White House was the extreme expression of dissent par excellence. Things haven't gone beyond that yet. There had been a big debate within the gay movement about whether or not we should have public demonstrations. And a lot of it was based on the fear we thought, boy, if somebody knew you were gay, they'd stone you to death or you know, attack you. You know, We didn't dare walk holding a sign saying that we were homosexuals. See, in those days, people thought it was very much smarter to uh, pass, and uh, that people who didn't want to pass were just inviting trouble. Nobody was out then. I was probably, certainly, for example, in my group down here, I was the only person who used my own name. Those early pickets were scary. It was scary because there were so few of us who could take the risk of being so public. For example, um, what if my boss sees me on the 6 o'clock news and fires me? Or what if my picture appears on the front page of my parents' hometown newspaper and causes grief or shockwaves in the town? 
And uh, what if some bystander starts throwing insults at us, or worse, bricks or stones? Uh, and what is the government going to do with all those photographs and tape recordings that they're taking of us? We had a dress code. And it's easy now to look back 35 years later and uh, laugh at it and make fun of it because it was a very strict code. But I think it was appropriate for the time, and I strongly supported it at the time. And I think it was right then because we were trying to get across a very unpopular message. We didn't want people to gawk at us. We wanted them to gawk at the messages on our signs in, and in our leaflets. Well, the philosophy um, was to make us look normal the way everybody else looked. So did we succeeded so well that, uh, as Frank Kameny said, um, some people thought we were actors. I remember specifically when we picketed in front of the Civil Service Commission, my, uh, I, um, my approach was they, we want them to employ us. Therefore, within the normal mode of the day, uh, we have to give the appearance of being employable. We were representing, we felt, all those hundreds of thousands or millions of other Americans that were homosexual. This is independence, national. What we saw it was a, a chance to remind uh, Americans on July 4th that we were equal citizens. And uh, what better place to do that than in front of the Liberty Bell? Independence Hall is where the thing was done. Both the uh, Declaration of Independence um, and uh, the Constitution were right there. It was right after the parade, the July 4th parade. And the, uh, the folding chairs were stacked up still, and, then, and everything had been dismantled, the bleachers. and. So then we came on and, and picketed it. I just felt a sense of, of uh, commitment and a sense of uh, passionate involvement. You know, it didn't bother me if people were negative. And there was a surprising lack of negativity there on the part of uh, bystanders. I think they, they were surprised. Uh, but they didn't give us any trouble that I recall. There was a photographer there who told me that all I needed was a good man, you know. Just, or perhaps he even said that all I needed to do was sleep with the man. And, and I, I said something like I didn't need that or something, and I, I just filmed, you know, and he stuck out his tongue at me. Otherwise, uh, it went off fine, and then uh, at the end, uh, um, on a signal, everybody, uh, we had, you know, signs on sticks, and everybody flipped down their signs, the demonstration was over. Once the flag lowering music that was from the loudspeaker, uh, started and we saw the flag lowering, we all stood and uh, put our right hand over our heart just to show that we were uh, good patriots and we respected the flag. You know, we were first class American citizens and we have wanted, that's a message we have wanted, we had wanted to tell everyone from the beginning. We are first class citizens. We are not marginal people. I feel that those demonstrations led directly into Stonewall in 69, and that without our demonstrations starting in 65, Stonewall would not have happened. Because what they did was to create the mindset for gay people who had never ever before done this to demonstrate publicly, to dissent publicly, to, to do things out in the open. And no, nobody had ever done this before. The 1969 demonstration took place just about a week after the Stonewall Rebellion in New York City. A lot of people who were fired up by the fight against the police at Stonewall came down to Philadelphia or came from other cities into Philadelphia and joined the demonstration and it was the largest we had ever had. There were about 150 people. That sounds like very little today, but for us it was a huge turnout. Here we saw uh, men in blue jeans, t-shirts, 
we saw a mixture, and it's that like the transition from the old to the new. All of this, it, it was sort of a movement pulling itself up by its bootstraps. If you want to pursue the metaphor, we created the bootstraps, and then other people pulled and pulled and pulled, and up it went. And uh, pretty soon you had um, marches on Washington with hundreds of thousands of people. You know, coming out in a picket line in 1965 was downright revolutionary for that time. It took gumption. It really took gumption and the conviction that we were right and the world was wrong. We were just at the start of cracking that cocoon of invisibility. Forty years after initiating these early street demonstrations, Frank Kameny and Barbara Giddings continue to speak out for civil rights. Barbara Giddings is also organizing her extensive private collection of gay movement materials to donate to a major archive. My mom was sitting in the kitchen. She said to me, you know, it's so strange. I just recently found out that uh, Jeff down the street is gay. And last year we found out that John so-and-so and his brother Pat were also gay. And she said, I don't know what's going on. I mean, this is on one street in suburban America. You know, is it something going on in the neighborhood or is there something in the water? And I just started to laugh. I just started to crack up and she said, why are you laughing? And I said, Mom, I'm gay too. <laughs> and I just felt so, I mean, it was so unplanned and so spontaneous. And, you know, I, I, I felt terrible doing it that way, but I just couldn't let the opportunity go by just to tell her that, um, you know, hey, you know, it's an epidemic on our street. <laughs> and she just kind of um, dropped her peeler or knife or paring knife and kind of put her face in her hands, and she didn't start getting hysterical, but she teared up a little bit, and um, I went over and hugged her immediately and just said, Mom, it's okay, it's okay. You know, I'm just me, I'm just me. And then I think we heard my father coming, and she quickly said, okay, you know, we're not, we're not gonna tell your father about this right now. Regarding my parents, uh, I, I, I really regret not telling them that I was gay. The, the rationalization I used for myself was that uh, they couldn't handle it or they don't want to know. Probably that they don't want to know was, was more correct and, and I think they could have handled it, really. Um, and, then, um, and then my father died. Uh, I was a grown man, of course, by this time. And there was this disappointment of, that he really didn't know me. And, and we had stopped talking about personal issues, about your personal life. The stark, icy landscape of Antarctica has captured the imagination of explorers for hundreds of years. You're about to meet two people, Anne Bancroft and Leave Arneson, who shatter the notion that women are too fragile to endure polar exploration. On November 13, 2000, Bancroft and expedition partner Lee Arneson set out to break a world record as the first women to cross Antarctica on foot. The two women used skis, cleats, and sails to make their way across this forbidding and foreign landscape. They pulled sleds that weighed 250 pounds full of food and equipment and endured temperatures as low as 30 degrees below zero with winds gusting up to 100 miles per hour. They made history 94 days and 1,717 miles later. Anne and Leave shot this remarkable video footage themselves. Being on this trip and, and trying to describe it is uh, what we saw and what we felt seeing all of that is really hard because um, in, in 97 days, we saw so much variety. Most people think it's a blue, white, boring, flat place. But we travel on glaciers. The plateau is different than the glaciers. The construction of the snow or the makeup of the snow and ice is different every day. The lighting is so astounding. 
it's changing during the day. And when that lighting changes in such an enormous place, when you're this little speck, it changes your whole surroundings. An extraordinary day was Christmas Day, and we had been hoping to sail. It was snowing on and off, which is very unusual in Antarctica. And uh, so it was very hard to distinguish what was ground and what was sky. It was, you know, enshrouding us. The wind picked up in the afternoon, and we got so excited that we packed up everything within uh, 40 minutes, I think, and we were hooked into our sails, and we started to sail, but it was still the whiteout. And then the sun came out and burst through some of that white, and uh, it, was, it was magic. However, not every day was Christmas. Some days were extraordinarily difficult. Their fingers and noses were numb from frostbite, and the terrain was often treacherous. When we started the trip, we were going up the glacier, and, and the snow was quite deep, and our sleds were 267 pounds. You know, and I'm weighing in at, at uh, 130. You know, that's, it was hard. Uh, and you think, how am I going to do this? You have these moments of, you know, what I call the heart thumpers, and you realize that you're extremely isolated. So, you know, we got into very difficult areas, and we, you know, would come back and we'd say, yeah, if we did get hurt here, it would be very hard to get rescued. I mean, you recognize those kinds of things. This was Anne and Leif's first expedition together. These two women, one lesbian and one straight, grew up on separate continents, but they shared a childhood dream of growing up to be explorers. Day 74. Dang. Eight day, the eighth day without wind. And we pull. Oh, we have the pulling, it's hard. I think it took me only a day or two that I really felt that we were sister spirits or sister souls because we had this kind of common uh, experience from the kids. I was reading the same books in Oslo like Anne did in St. Paul. We just got to know each other two and a half years ago and um, uh, leave wrote me in 1993. I had just returned from Antarctica. She was about to embark on a solo expedition, very similar route to the one we had just completed, and was interested in um, knowing about wind direction, et cetera, for a variety of reasons. Just you talk to everybody you can before you go. Um, and I knew I wanted to return to this remarkable continent. So I sort of stuffed her number away, and I thought, I need to meet this woman for one reason or another. One, because I want to perhaps travel with her. If she's crazy enough to go by herself, that's just what I'm looking for. Well, I didn't know uh, that Anne was a lesbian before I actually came into her house and Pam, and, and I met Pam. And, uh, but, but by then, uh, I had met her, I talked to her, and uh, we had exchanged mail or, or, or letters, so I had, had a positive feeling. And to me, it was more important uh, that she had a good relationship with her partner than that, that she actually was a lesbian, because going on an expedition like that, it's kind of uh, can, can affect the expedition if the person you go with uh, has a bad relationship. She has a good sense of humor, and it's fun to be with her. And uh, some days was really depressing. Uh, the wind did not come, and we had uh, to work hard to pull the sledges. And we said to ourselves that we're, today I'm depressed. So we put up the video camera, and put up our mouth harps and make some jokes. We don't talk a lot on these journeys. We've got face masks on, the wind is blowing, we're in single file, you're exhausted. Uh, they're not elements that are conducive to conversation anyway. And it's, it's a long, long journey, so I always say that we have lots of friends that we climb and kayak with and do outdoor endeavors that are very skilled, but they're very clear that they don't have the personality to go on a 100-day expedition. And we do, we, we revel in the fact that we will have this time away. It feels like a privilege to us. And in fact, the time went very fast. Preparing for a trip like this is grueling work. In addition to securing endorsements, getting supplies and testing equipment, there is the physical aspect of the training, which takes each woman up to six hours a day. In the warmer months, when there's no snow on the ground, Anne runs for two to four hours, dragging tires to simulate the weight of her sled. The outdoors is her gym. She strengthens and tones by chopping all of the wood she uses to heat her house, and by canoeing in a nearby river. Where's 
as former school teachers, both Bancroft and Arneson are dedicated to using their adventures to inspire young people, and girls especially, to follow their dreams. They are working in partnership with schools and educators to bring the lessons of their journeys to a global classroom through the internet. I used to be an elementary school teacher and a high school coach in 85 when I uh, was chosen to go on an expedition to the North Pole. I took a sabbatical, and that sabbatical has extended to now, so uh, I, I never returned to the formal classroom, in part because I realized that I could do these expeditions and still be a teacher. My classroom would just be a bit broader and uh, have more flexibility. My kids would be not just my 30 kids. They would be uh, classrooms all over the country and then now uh, in a global setting. Sandra Leslie, please. No, this is Anne. When we were on the ice, we communicated through a satellite phone. Every day we would give a report, which then went on the website, utilizing our voices. It is day 30, uh, the 13th of December. We woke to 18 below. And I mean, it's just phenomenal, the way in which we could be so remote and still feel very um, intimate with our audience and have such a large audience. This has been a life process, and concretely, it's been 11 years in planning the Traverse, so I have needed positive voices, whether it's coming from my partner Pam, whether it's coming from what I call my inner circle of really good friends that, that knows me, uh, and sometimes it comes from kids, because kids are still so optimistic. They don't look at me as a woman or somebody that they perceive as small. They're just like, that's a cool adventure, go. And I can get energized by that. Anne Bancroft and Leave Arneson are planning an expedition to cross the Arctic Ocean in March of 2007. They will rendezvous with a scientific team studying the impact of global warming. I had just started to think about being a lesbian. It was just like an inkling in the back of my brain. And uh, I was at the front porch, and we keep our, our actually piano table desk in front of the porch to protect from any outsiders, which is kind of ironic. And uh, Time Magazine was there, and Ellen DeGeneres was on the cover of Time Magazine because she had just come out, out on her show. And I said to my mom, and I don't really believe that I just said it like this. I was like, Mom, I'm gay. And she looked at the cover of Time, and she said, you've been watching too much of this. <laughs> I walked into the room where they were watching The West Wing. And at the time, my mother was very into The West Wing. It was her show, and we weren't allowed to speak during the show. But I walked in, and I was nervous. So I was kind of shaking, and I was looking a little sweaty. And I said, Mom, Dad, I really need to talk to you. And my mom looked at me, and she said, oh, the West Wing's on right now. You can wait. And I said, no, this is something that's really important. I need to talk to you right now. She kind of stared me down, and I was like, no, I need to tell you. I have to. So I went through this whole thing about how I've thought about this for a while and this is really who I am and I, I still love you guys and I, I hope that you're okay with this. And I said, I'm gay. And my mom looked at me and she said, I am trying to watch the West Wing. You can wait for a commercial. And I sort of sat there and I was stunned and I said, that's it? That, that's all I get? There's, there's nothing? She just shrugged and she said, yeah, you know, we kind of knew. Hidden in an old brownstone in Brooklyn is a rare collection of once forgotten lesbian histories. For the past 32 years, the volunteer caretakers of this archive have gathered rich and diverse stories from the lesbian community. And seven years ago, In the Life documented this unique endeavor. We began talking about how easily our history had gotten lost that we didn't want our story to be told by, quote, a patriarchal history keeper. I didn't want our story to be told by those who called us freaks to begin with. And that if we didn't do it, nobody was going to do it for us. Joan Nessel and Deb Adel are two of the founders of the Lesbian Her Story Archives in New York, which is celebrating its 25th anniversary this year. 
For all of those years, they have been collecting the writings, photographs, publications, T-shirts, buttons, in fact, all of the materials that tell the many histories of lesbian lives. And for almost 20 of those years, the entire collection was housed in Joan Nessel's own apartment. This wasn't going to be a one-night stand. <laughs> It was going to be a long-term relationship. We had a commitment to the archives that, one, it had to be a lifelong commitment, because just think, if an archives doesn't outlast at least one generation, it's not an archives. So it started in a back room, and my mother was living here at the time, and it was this, we'd have these meetings around the table. My mother would come out without her teeth in, and she'd say, very good, girls, very good. <laughs> If it's done by a lesbian, we collect it. If it's thought about by a lesbian, we collect it. If it's written by a lesbian, if it's touched by a lesbian, we, we collect it. We have papers and diaries and journals. We have photographs. Traditional archives have been about famous people. And from the beginning, that was not our view, that this was an archives that belonged to the people who lived its history. In the life of Mabel Hampton, which is, to, for me, at the spiritual heart of the archives, captures that. Because in traditional history, Mabel Hampton's story would not be told. She was a domestic worker for most of her life. She was an entertainer. She was a participant in the Harlem Renaissance. And I know Miss Hampton, and this is harder for me to talk about. At one point, Miss Hampton worked for my mother, and that's how I met her. And she was the first lesbian woman I ever knew. And the courage this woman had, as you would, you would ask Mabel later in life, when she was here with the archives and she was living here, women would make pilgrimages to see her on Thursday night, and they'd sit at her feet. And she was, she she loved the ladies, she loved the girls, as she called them. And they'd say, "Well, Mabel, when were you? When did you come out?" And she'd say, "What do you mean? When did I come out? I was never in." A few years ago, my lover then found a T-shirt, and the T-shirt was about famous black women in history. And it listed all the famous women, Sojourner Truth, and the last name on that list was Mabel Hampton. You know, so in her 80s, she became this really out gay activist. In 1991, after years of planning and fundraising, the Lesbian Her Story Archives bought this building in Brooklyn, New York. We did a lot, as a group, a lot of fundraising um, in order to get this building. We had people giving us small donations, and we were able to put down half of the building, really, um, half of the cost of the building at the time of purchase from donations, 99% of which were 25, 55. Eventually, those small donations enabled the archives to pay off the entire mortgage. That was a very exciting moment for us, to really realize that we could claim the mortgage, tear up the mortgage, and not be beholden to any bank um, or any outside group that this was our building, the lesbian community's building. Here we are on the first floor in the parlor, and the books and materials that we have in this room really represent um, the most traditional sort of library. We have a vast collection of subject files ranging everything from newsprint to um, pamphlets to flyers about lesbian activities and events. And then over here we have a very special collection. This we call the Red Dot Collection. It was the library of the New York City chapter of the Daughters of Belitis. And it really represents what lesbians were reading in the 1960s, 1950s and 60s, and it's a wonderful collection. That's the Lesbian Survival Collection. They're a wonderful collection of paperbacks from the 50s and 60s. And I had read them myself when I came out in the 50s. That was all there was. And they were read all over this country. In fact, they were bestsellers. These were the secreted books. And some of them were very powerful. They were handbooks on how to survive as a lesbian woman. Women who wrote under assumed names and women who wrote using their own names, they had absolutely no control of the text, the title, or the content. 
If there was a sex scene between two women, a woman had to lose her child, her job, or die. So we read around the markings of hatred and control and found remarkable things. Here we are in the dining room. We use it for exhibits. We have tapes, photography, flat art, posters, graphics, and an extensive videotape collection. The archives is run by a coordinating committee. We meet every three weeks, and we all sign up on the calendar for the days we're actually going to staff and be here. We don't have any paid staff. We don't have any plans at this point to have paid staff. We are part of the community, and it's our community who will um, keep us going. And it's absolutely paid off. We had decided early on that the Lesbian History Archives would not be what we call a role model collection, meaning that we wanted the stories of all lesbian women. And if they were sex workers, we wanted that story. And if they were S&M women, we wanted that story. All of this got more, even more complex when just a few years ago, maybe two or three years ago, we got the collection of a woman, a lesbian woman, who had been an FBI informant in the 50s, informing on labor movement groups. A woman who had spent much of her, her later life in Provincetown ran one of the most famous lesbian tourist spots in Provincetown and was very loved by that community and her past very little known. And I remember one woman saying to me, very fervent woman saying, well, yeah, well, if there was a lesbian Nazi group, you wouldn't want their papers. And I, as a Jew, saying, we certainly would. One, we, have, we need to understand. You know, it's, it's an uncomfortable collection, but it's important. Now with its diverse collection and own rich history, In the Life congratulates the Lesbian History Archives on its 25th anniversary. The fact we're still here after 25 years is just amazing. I got my best friend up, Kahun Nahana, who's from Hawaii. And uh, I, we were very, very close friends. I knew about her sex life because I drove her to a motel with her boyfriend, and uh, I woke her up, and we went up to the kitchen, because that was one of the safe places to talk. It wasn't always safe to talk in the barracks. And in the kitchen, you could make enough noise for it to be safe. So we're making noise in the kitchen, and I said to Kahuna, I think I'm gay. And she says, what? I said, I think I'm gay. Well, how do you know? I said, she had blue eyes. That's all I can tell you. And I called my dad, and I said, Bonnie and I want to move in together, and we're buying a house together. And he said, oh, what are you buying a house for, with another girl for? You'll never get married if you do that. And, and Bonnie was across the room saying to me in sort of sign language, tell him, tell him. And she finally looked at me like she was going to walk out if I didn't tell him. And I said, well, Dad, I, I want to buy a house with another woman, because he says, oh, it's the wrong thing to do. I said, well, Dad, let me tell you, it's because we want to live together um, for the rest of our lives. Uh, do you understand what I'm talking about? And he said, I think so. I said, well, how do you feel about that? And there was a long pause, and he said, well, it is 1982. And then I heard him say to his wife, my stepmother, Joan, get me a drink. Michael Judge was known for his strong handshake, his Irish charm, and his uncanny ability to connect with people. On the morning of September 11th, 2001, he raced to the Twin Towers to be with the men he considered his brothers, the firefighters of New York City. Tonight, on the eve of the fifth anniversary of this tragedy, In the Life pays tribute to this extraordinary priest. A picture was the world's introduction to Father Michael Judge, a snapshot of a man killed in the line of duty moments after the attack on the World Trade Center. In an instant, his lifeless body blanketed in the dust and debris of destruction, Father Michael became a national hero. But as the weeks and months since the terror attacks slip away, a more complex portrait of Father Michael is coming to light. Above all else, he was a priest. Michael's character was defined very much by his priesthood and being a Franciscan. 
Father Brian Carroll is a fellow friar at St. Francis of Assisi Church in Manhattan. The two of them shared a friendship that lasted more than 20 years. Michael was a, a really dear friend of mine, and not only a dear friend, but uh, I'd consider him a role model. We'd be walking down the street, and he would hand out money to anybody. And by the time we got to a restaurant, we didn't have anything to uh, spend. We couldn't get dinner. We'd end up getting a cup of coffee because he would have given everything away. As fire chaplain, Father Michael also devoted much of his life ministering to New York City's fire department. His church is directly across the street from one of the firehouses. He always had the right thing to say. He always put you at ease if you had a problem. You could talk to him. And uh, he just made our life easier, you know. I don't know how we're going to replace him. Many of his friends and colleagues have called him a bridge between communities. Father Michael also reached across denominations and forged a strong friendship with Reverend Fanny Erickson of New York's Riverside Church. I would say he was deep, brilliant, worried a lot, but he was brave. He had a bit of the leprechaun in him, and he really understood what ministry was about. Since his death, we have learned this man's ministry went far beyond the fire department. It extended into the gay and lesbian community. Many gay newspapers and magazines have profiled Michael Judge, not only concerning his outreach, but also frankly discussing the Catholic priest's own sexuality. Trust me, he'd probably be delighted to see himself on the front cover of uh, The Advocate magazine, along with all the other hunks that normally fill that page. Brendan Fay, one of the driving forces behind the gay Irish organization Lavender and Green, would certainly know. He and his partner were good friends of Father Michael Judge. I would say um, being gay and being Catholic, for many, it's a tremendous conflict. And I would say for Michael, the challenge was not being gay and Catholic, the challenge was being honest and acceptance. And while Father Michael was not out to all people, he did openly throw his support behind many gay causes. Out of the Closet Thrift Shop is a New York City institution. The store's profits fund dozens of AIDS organizations across the country. Father Michael was a familiar face here, both as a customer and a donor. Very friendly, very helpful, uh, seemed very enthusiastic about the store, and um, came in, I say, once every three to four months. Uh, once calling ahead happily, brought 500 items from a dry cleaners that was closing. People were sick or ill. He would be the first person at the hospital. And that led him uh, later on when he returned to New York, uh, still fairly early on in the AIDS epidemic, to uh, begin doing some things right here at St. Francis uh, and start reaching out to folks. And he's done that consistently and reverently uh, since I've known him, up until the day he died. One of Father Michael's riskiest moves also serves as one of his defining moments. In March 2000, New York City's first all-inclusive St. Patrick's Day parade took place in Queens and openly embraced gays and lesbians. Father Michael helped fund the event, and then, to the delight of the organizers, he showed up in his cassock, marched in the parade, and offered a prayer. Give us good health, peace, happiness, the joy of the parade, and a wonderful blessing for the day. Amen. There was a wonderful spirit in the parade. Um, but uh, to be honest, there was also the boos, the screams. And as a, a Franciscan, as a priest, he was the focus and target of some of the boos and the screams that day. He had a terrific sense of humor. And he'd either say, ah, Jesus, he'd said, the height of madness, God help them, you know? and. And in some way, that taught me as well, don't get too bogged down or don't be overwhelmed with bitterness or anger. On October 11th, hundreds of people packed a small chapel in Manhattan for a ceremony called A Month's Mind, an Irish tradition of remembering a loved one through stories exactly one month after their death. The Lavender and Green Society organized the event, which was filled with people, gay and straight, who knew Father Judge. He was a very affable, a very sociable sort of a man, and uh, he moved in all sorts of circles. He always seemed to capture a little bit of you, a little essence of you, and um, it, he was always one of those people when you saw him made you smile. Many of those touched by Father Michael's death never even knew him, including Tom Ryan, an openly gay New York City firefighter. 
I had, I had heard that he was a, a gay priest, and um, I'm an out gay firefighter and president of Firefighter EMS, and I never wanted to compromise his position with the church and, and that, and I regret that now, that I didn't get to know him. And he put himself at risk by revealing himself, for example, to uh, people in the gay community. When they needed to have their lives affirmed, and speaking in the third person wouldn't do. Michael would reveal himself to them and give them the gift of himself. And Brian Carroll received that gift. Father Michael helped the fellow priest to understand his own sexuality. I think Michael embraced that. And he taught me to do that, to speak to the truth of who I am. And I think uh, he is definitely uh, the most influential person in my life, being gay, being a priest, being a Franciscan and not to compartmentalize that, but to try to synthesize that. Father Michael wrote a prayer he used to share with others. Lord, take me where you want me to go. Let me meet who you want me to meet. Tell me what you want me to say, and keep me out of your way. On September 11th, it was that faith that led Father Michael downtown after the planes crashed into the Twin Towers. I said, Mike, there's been a disaster. Uh, a plane just hit the World Trade Center, I saw it, and he jumped up uh, from the couch and he said, oh my God, and I said, they're gonna need you, and all of a sudden his uh, fire department beepers went off and he was out the door, and that was the last I saw him. Father Michael died while administering last rites to a fallen firefighter. His body was carried into a nearby church. We went into the church and it was just, it was one of those moments that it was just eerily beautiful, and they had laid his body just in front of the altar and covered it with a sheet, and they laid his um, badge and his ID card on his chest and his stole on his, uh, folded up beautifully on his legs. And it was just, everybody just knelt quietly and cried, and then got up and we went back to work. So when I got the call, um, it was such, uh, it was so sad, and uh, in fact, it was truly like I had lost, lost a lover, lost a friend, and, and we have. He had a special gift given to him by, by God. You know, he was uh, the first one. Everyone who was killed down there was given yeah. a number, and he was number one, so we like to say that that was because he was there to lead everybody into heaven. I had written my mother and sister a letter and my father a letter. I left my mother's and sister's letter on the answering machine and my father's letter on the toilet because <laughs> I knew that they would both find them there. And I went off to work and I had decided that, you know, this was going to be it. If they didn't, you know, accept me, then I had, I didn't pack anything, which was, I think, a sign that I, maybe perhaps I knew more, I had more faith in them than I had, you know, than I, the, I had the amount of faith in them that I should have. Um, but I did have a lot of money with me, <laughs> and I went to work, and, um, and by the time I got there, I was, I mean, that drive over was the longest drive of my life, but by the time I got to work, my boss came out, and he, he said, your mother called, and I was like, oh, no, and he said, and she said that she loves you anyway. My dad is a bishop. Um, he founds churches all across the, uh, the Eastern Seaboard and uh, writes books about the Trinity. Um, and so I decide finally, okay, I'm going to give him a call. I'm going to tell him, you know, more about myself because I felt like I was really, you know, having superficial conversations with him in many ways. And so I gave him a call and I said, you know, Dad, um, I don't know if you know this, but um, I need to talk to you about, do you, you know, I need to talk to you about what it means for me to be trans. Um, and I told him that I didn't identify as female um, and that I um, use male pronouns and that I um, date men and women. And um, he had this amazing response where he just said, you know, it's taken 22 years for us to be in each other's lives. Um, you know, that's fine, whatever. You know, I love you, and and that was all. And it was just, it was overwhelmingly, um, it was just a beautiful moment. It's been 25 years since HIV AIDS began to devastate the gay community in the United States. 
This disease has had a profound impact on artists, inspiring some extraordinary work that reveals the collective experiences of loss, fear, and rage. In the early years of this crisis, many artists were dying and their work was sometimes lost forever. Five years ago, In the Life featured an organization called The Estate Project that preserves these historic expressions of an epidemic. Jack Waters is a New York-based filmmaker, writer, and dancer who was diagnosed with HIV in 1992. In honor of Gay Pride this past summer, New York City's Donald Library commissioned Waters and his partner, Peter Kramer, to install their exhibit called Pride 2001 in a window of the library. It's a uh, three-channel video installation and uh, photographs that are my photographs and also archival material from various gay and lesbian publications. So what we were working on conceptually was the idea of AIDS and AIDS history, but especially about how it's become erased from the popular consciousness. To assist artists like Jack Waters, the advocacy group Alliance for the Arts founded the Estate Project for Artists with AIDS in 1991. It was founded to assist families and survivors to, in preserving the work uh, of artists that were being directly affected by the, by the epidemic. And artists in the broadest sense, uh, performing arts, visual arts, literature, uh, dance, filmmaking, etc. Jack Waters is one of the artists that, is, that we've had the opportunity, whose films we've had the opportunity to, uh, to preserve and master in the film preservation program. Jack, are you there? Jackie, Jackie, are you there? I have been active in the AIDS HIV movement since the mid-80s, since my friends started getting sick and dying. Getting an HIV diagnosis is a major life change. And being an artist, of course, it changes the way one approaches one's art. For me, in retrospect, I would say that the thing that's really changed the most um, as being uh, HIV positive and diagnosed with AIDS is this idea that there's not that much time. Let me try and explain the impetus for starting the estate project for artists with AIDS. A lot of people in society were um, reeling at that time in the early 90s from the cumulative impact of AIDS. And in the midst of all of that, we in the arts became aware of uh, what we understood as a secondary loss. The first loss was, of course, of people. But we began to realize that when those people were artists, they, there was a double loss. The art itself that they created, their most personal and lasting expression, was um, uh, cut off because of the shortness of their lives. And of course, in many of those cases, that, that the subject of that work became AIDS in, uh, itself, or the epidemic, or death, or mortality itself, which certainly would not have been the case if they had lived a normal lifespan. Currently, the focus of the estate project is primarily archival. They have launched the online virtual collection in partnership with Visual Aids, the only national organization that provides direct services to HIV-positive visual artists and documents their work in the largest archive of its kind. In addition, the Estate Project has archives for dance and musical works in the making, work that in many cases would have otherwise been lost. I've known and known of many artists who have died of AIDS before they've had an opportunity to make plans for their artwork after they've died. When that has happened, many times the, there develop tremendous fights between gallery owners and, and family members as who has the rights to the work. And as a result of that, um, the tragic result of that is that oftentimes the work gets lost, it gets discarded, it gets held up in litigation, it gets, well, it dies. As the culmination of its first decade of work, the estate project produced Loss Within Loss, which was edited by prominent out gay writer Edmund White, who is himself HIV positive. Uh, Loss Within Loss is a subtitle The Artist in the Age of AIDS, and it's a collection of essays by various people about 
those in the arts who have died of AIDS. A lot of the essays are about artists who were not known. In general, if, if the artists whom we know and revere had died before age 40, we would never have heard of their names. And so we have the beginnings of careers and the beginnings of reputations, but the danger of these people being forgotten entirely. One of the contributors to Loss Within Loss is writer and activist Sarah Shulman. Well, you know, I think there was a dominant aesthetic to AIDS art at a certain era, the end of the 80s. The chaos, the panic, the sadness, the desperation that you see in AIDS art that's made right at the height of the crisis. Work that's not finished, that's sloppy, that's a mess because the people are a mess, because everyone's upset, because no one knows what to do. In a sense, formally, that is the most authentic representation of the emotion. AIDS certainly brought about a, an interest in the two great themes of human existence, uh, love and death. And I think it was remarkable that there was that kind of serious focus that was suddenly brought to these two subjects in the gay community, because the gay community, like the rest of America, uh, was sort of almost too jokey to talk about love and, and death phobic. So uh, it, it, it took something as extraordinary as, as AIDS to uh, finally break this taboo. The publication of Loss Within Loss, which marks the 10th anniversary of the estate project, also coincides with another anniversary. In 2001, GMHC, or Gay Men's Health Crisis, turns 20. GMHC was founded in New York City in 1981 by a group of gay men as the first organization in the world to fight AIDS. As a reminder of the contributions that artists have made to the struggle against AIDS, GMHC commissioned an art exhibit at the Museum of the City of New York this past summer. The, the show is a, is, a is a collection of a variety of objects. You have from posters to photographs to personal mementos that, momentums that people have had to um, critical announcements and press releases. The initial art that we remember is art by white male artists. It is not the case throughout the epidemic as it unfortunately evolved and continued to expanding into other communities. So did the artist works, you know? Artists from all communities, black artists, Latino artists, women, have participated, produced, and continue to this day to do that. A lot of what, what Jean and I are doing is exploring that and sort of, and something actually, you know, sort of the relationship between what happens when you create activists propaganda and means of communication and then it becomes that very that very piece becomes um, a document and then it becomes an artifact and then it's seen as art the direct consequences of AIDS the suffering and death of artists of every discipline left its mark on the art of the 80s and 90s but even if a cure were found tomorrow the impact of AIDS on the arts will be felt for decades to come now we have a generation of people my age who have had a profound experience of, with death and in great quantity. And here we are, middle-aged, facing the second halves of our lives. And I think that we do all of that very differently than we would have without that loss that came before. And the way that that aging will be represented in the artwork that we make will always be determined by the experiences that we had at the height of the AIDS crisis. I'm Cherry Jones, and for all of us at In The Life, thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next month.
Funded in part by the H. Van Ameringen Foundation. Additional support provided by the Ford Foundation, the New Pole Foundation, the Overbrook Foundation, Michael A. Leppin, and the annual support of In the Life members like you.